All right, let's get right into it. Your assigned problems may or may not have different randomized values. For best results, attempt the assignment on your own before watching these solutions. Students are encouraged to frequently pause the video to work out steps on their own before proceeding with the solutions. And here's the list of topics to be covered in this video. In problem one, we're going to be given several tables that could represent functions or not, and if they do, are they linear, exponential, or neither? So here's the first table, the second, and the third. Now for a linear function, there will be a slope. Delta y over delta x will be some sort of constant. In contrast, for an exponential function, the ratio of x plus delta x divided by f of x will be constant as long as delta x remains fixed. Now in all of the tables shown, delta x equals 1. They all go from x equals 1, 2, 3, 4, always increasing by 1. So using delta x equals 1, in a linear function, delta y, f of x plus 1 minus f of x, will be the same constant always, whereas in an exponential function, the ratio f of x plus 1 divided by f of x will be constant. So first, let's check linearity. In each table, we'll move and compute a bunch of delta y's. Are they always the same or not? So here we have a difference of 16. However, if we look here, the difference is not 16. So this is definitely not a linear function. In the second table, we have a difference of negative 20, and here a difference of negative 20, and here also a difference of negative 20. Since delta y is constant, this is a linear function. And in the last table, we have a delta y computed to be negative 36, and this will not be negative 36, therefore this is not a linear function. Now to check for exponentiality, we can compute the ratio f of x plus 1 divided by f of x moving from cell to cell. In the first, we'll end up with a ratio of 4 over 5 once you simplify the fractions, 4 over 5 again, and if you simplify 40.96 divided by 51.2, it will be exactly 4 over 5. So the ratio f of x plus delta x divided by f of x was the same. This is an exponential function. Here, 60 divided by 80 is 3 fourths whereas 40 divided by 60 is not. So since the ratio f of x plus 1 over f of x is not constant, this is not an exponential function. Down at the bottom, f of x plus 1 divided by f of x, 24 over 60 is 2 fifths. And here we have a negative number over a positive one. The ratio is not going to be 2 fifths, so this is not an exponential function. In problem two, we have the function f of x equals a times b to the x. a and b are both given to be positive numbers, and we need to determine which of the following list of statements are true. First, is the horizontal asymptote x equals zero? That's not even a horizontal line, definitely false. Is the range of the function all real numbers? No, the range of the exponential part will be positive numbers, and a is positive, so you can only get positive numbers out of this, you can't get all real numbers. Is the horizontal asymptote y equals zero? This is true. Now, if b is larger than 1, then b to negative large numbers will be very, very small, and you'll have a horizontal asymptote of 0. If b is less than 1, then b to large positive numbers will be small, and you'll still have a horizontal asymptote of y equals 0. Now, if b happens to be equal to exactly 1, then 1 to the x will just be 1, and you'll have a constant function. The way the problem was originally written did not specify that b cannot be 1, but that is typically an assumption when dealing with exponential functions that you're not dealing with a base of 1. So I'm going to assume that b was not supposed to be equal to 1, and therefore, yes, there is definitely a horizontal asymptote of y equals 0. The horizontal asymptote is the point 0 comma a. A point isn't a line. This is just ridiculous. The domain of the function is all real numbers. This is true. As long as you have a positive base, b to the x, the domain will be all real numbers. Is the range of the function all positive numbers? This is true. Again, unless b is equal to 1, but we're just assuming that when we have exponential functions. What about the domain of the exponential function being x is positive? We've already established the domain of exponential functions with positive bases is all reals, so it's not just positive x's. Problem three, an exponential function a times b to the x passes through two explicit points, 0 comma 10 and 2 comma 250. What are the values of a and b? So f of 0 is 10. So a times b to the 0 is 10, b to the 0 is 1 and therefore 10 is equal to a. Again, we're assuming b is a positive number that isn't exactly equal to 1, because that's typically how these exponential functions go. So a is equal to 10. f of 2 is 250, so a times b squared is 250. We already know a to be 10, so b squared is 25. b is plus or minus 5. 
it's conceivably possible that b is negative 5, but then the domain would not be all real numbers. It would be a very unusual function. So b is probably positive 5. Problem 4. Again, we have an exponential function, a times b to the x. We're just going to continue this running assumption that b is positive and not equal to 1. Passing through two explicit points, we solve the same way we did in the previous problem. Since f of 0 is 12,000, we end up with the result that a must be 12,000. Since f of 3 is 768, once we divide by the known quantity of a, we get that b cubed is 8 over 125. The cube root of that is 2 fifths. For problem 5, find the formula for an exponential function going through two points. So we're just going to let it take the same form as in the previous problems, a times b to the x. Going ahead and setting f of negative 3 equal to 4 over 27 and f of 1 equal to 12. Now note that we don't know the intercept, so we were not letting x equal 0. We don't get a immediately out of this, but we have two expressions that have a in it. So if we take the ratio of these two expressions, we'll be able to cancel a. By the way, we know that a is not 0, because a times b to the x is not 0. So if I take the ratio of the two expressions, a times b to the first over a times b to the minus 3, we know that a times b to the first is 12, and a times b to the minus 3 is 4 over 27. We cancel the a's, we get b to the fourth is 81, meaning b is plus or minus 3, but again, we presume positive bases for our exponential functions. Now we can take this known value of b and plug it into either of our original expressions to find a. It's a lot easier, I think, to plug it into 12 is equal to a times b. Since b is 3, this gives us that a must be 4. Therefore, our function f of x equals 4 times 3 to the x. It's an exponential function that matches the two points we're given. Problem 6, match the functions to the graphs. So we have five different exponential functions. They are all graphed to the right and we need to match which is which. Now, when you have an exponential function, note that the intercept is given by f of 0. And if b is larger than 1, the bigger b is, the faster the function increases. You're taking larger numbers to powers. Whereas if b is less than 1, the function decreases the faster the smaller b is. You'll have a smaller number to larger and larger powers. So option d is the only function whose intercept will not be at y equals 4. So that must be the black curve here. This is the largest base. Okay, 1.5 is the largest of all of the bases, so it will have the fastest increase. That matches the red function. This is the next largest base that we haven't already matched up to its non-4 intercept. So the next largest base will have the next fastest increase. So that's the blue curve. This is actually the smallest base, 0.66, so it will go down the fastest, that's the orange curve. And finally, the next smallest base will have the next smallest fastest decrease, the green curve. In problem 7, all of the functions below are of the form a times b to the x. For which is b the largest? That will be the one where the curve is increasing the fastest, the blue curve. For which is b the smallest? Then we're looking for the fastest decreasing, that's O, the orange curve. And for which is A the largest? A gives us the intercept, and looking at the curves, the largest intercept is the red curve. Problem 8, match these four functions to the graphs. We have negative 2 to the x, negative 2 to the negative x, 2 to the x, and 2 to the minus x. By the way, in options capital A and B, it's not a negative 2 in parentheses. Negative 2 is not being raised to a power. 2 is being raised to a power, and then we're multiplying by negative 1. So our standard exponential graph, a positive number larger than 1 to the x, is not being reflected in either direction, and that standard thing will go up and up and up the larger x is. That's the green curve, okay? So 2 to the x, a positive number, larger than 1 to the x power, is green. Now compared to this as our starting point, note that every other option is either a horizontal or vertical reflection. So for example, this has been vertically reflected, it's been multiplied by negative 1, it has not been horizontally reflected, the x has not been multiplied by negative 1. So compared to the green curve, which one is a vertical reflection? That's the orange curve. Here, we don't have a vertical reflection because the 2 outside has not been multiplied by minus 1, but the x has been. That's a horizontal reflection. So which curve is a horizontal reflection of the original green curve? The blue one. And this one, we reflect both horizontally and vertically, and that's the red curve.
For problem 9, match each formula to the graph. We've got 4 to the x, negative 1 fifth to the x, 1 fifth to the x, and negative 4 to the x. So basically we have 4 to the x and 1 fifth to the x and their negatives. So 4 to the x will have a positive range. We have a nice exponential with a positive base and it's not being multiplied by a negative intercept. Also, as x goes to plus infinity, we're raising 4 to successively larger and larger powers. That goes to infinity. So of all the graphs, there's only one whose range is positive, And as x goes to the right, the graph goes to infinity. That's the one in the upper right. In contrast, this has a negative range because we have an exponential times a negative number. But as x gets larger and larger, 1 over 5 to the x will collapse to 0. So which has a negative range and off to the right goes to 0? It's the bottom left. Here we have a positive range and it still goes to zero. That's the one in the upper left. And here we have a negative range, again, because we are multiplying by negative one outside the exponential. And now as x goes to plus infinity, four to the x goes to infinity, but it is being multiplied by negative one. And that's the one down here. In problem 10, we're starting with f of x equals 7 to the x, and we're going to do a bunch of transformations to it, and each of these is their own individual problem. You're not intended to do them in sequence, but just one and then the other and then the other as different problems. So first, what happens when f is shifted down by 9 units? In other words, take f of x and subtract 9, so 7 to the x minus 9. Well, what if f of x were shifted 5 units to the left? We replace x with x plus 5, so f of x plus 5 is 7 to the x plus 5. Note, by the way, due to properties of exponents, you could rewrite this as 7 to the 5th times 7 to the x. 7 to the 5th is a large number, but now we've just multiplied the original function 7 to the x by a number 7 to the 5th. That's a vertical stretch. For exponential functions, exactly due to this arithmetic, horizontal movements and vertical stretches are the same thing. And finally, f of x is reflected across the y-axis. Reflected across the vertical axis means replace all of your x's with minus x's. That's 7 to the minus x. Problem 10, we want to draw the graph of f of x equals 5 to the x plus 3. So the graph of 5 to the x will have intercept 0, 1. It will increase by a factor of 5 every unit we move to the right, and decrease by a factor of 5 with every unit we move to the left. So here is a rough drawing of what that would look like. It goes to the intercept 0, 1, and I did my best to make it go through 1, 5, and then by the time it gets to x equals 2, it will be all the way at a height of 25. Similarly, when x is minus 1, we should be at a fifth, and then it will just sort of collapse down to 0. It will never equal 0, so I didn't quite make it touch the axis. But this is 5 to the x. Our function, however, is 5 to the x translated left by 3. So we slide this 3 units to the left, and here we go. In problem 12, let's draw the graph of f of x equals negative 1 half to the x minus 2. We're going to begin by drawing the graph of 1 half to the x. Now, if x equals 0, a positive number to the 0 is 1, so we'll have the intercept 0, 1. Because the base is less than 1, as we move right, we decrease, specifically by a factor of 2. We're multiplying by a half. Whereas if we move left, we will increase by a factor of 2. So here was my best attempt at drawing something that has intercept 0, 1. Notice that at x equals 1, we're at a height of a half, at x equals 2, a quarter, then an eighth, and so forth. But I never made it touch the axis because this will never actually equal 0. And as we move to the left, we have x equal minus 1 being y equals 2, x equals minus 2 gives y equals 4, x equals minus 3 gives y equals 8, and so forth. So this is a pretty reasonable graph of 1 half to the x. However, the function we're asked to draw is translated right by 2 because x is replaced with x minus 2. So let's slide this two units to the right. And then, because we're multiplying by negative 1, we reflect it across the x-axis. Problem 13, the graph below is some sort of transformation of 2 to the x. Write an equation by determining what it's being multiplied by, capital A, and what it's been shifted by, k. Now the two points on this graph that seem to have integer coordinates are 0, 3 and 2, 0. So letting x equal 0 and getting out y equals 3 and letting x equal 2 and getting out y equals 0, we get 3 is equal to a plus k, whereas 0 is equal to a times 2 squared plus k. So 3 is a plus k, 0 is 4a plus k. We have two linear equations in two unknowns, so we have various methods of solving this. Since I see a k in both of them, I'm just going to take one and subtract the other. On the left, we have 3 minus 0, then a minus 4a and k minus k. The k's cancel. That was the point. 
3 is equal to negative 3a or a is equal to negative 1. So putting that into either expression that we already had will give us k. I'm just going to pick the one that doesn't have a 4 in it. 3 is equal to a plus k. Replace a with negative 1, add 1 to both sides, and k must equal 4. So the function is given by y equals negative 2 to the x plus 4. In problem 14, we're given a graph and asked to find a function that could produce it. So we're looking for some sort of exponential, some b to the x times an a plus a k. We don't need to worry about a left or right translation. The reason why, as remarked in one of the previous problems, is that for an exponential, a horizontal translation is the same thing as multiplying by some constant a. So the constant a already accounts for any possible horizontal translation. Also, if a is positive or negative tells us whether the original graph of some exponential hasn't or has been vertically reflected. So this does account for a vertical translation, that's the k. The horizontal translation can be absorbed into the constant capital A, which also accounts for possible vertical reflections. So what we need to do is find two points on the curve. We can definitely spot 0, comma, negative 4. In general, try to find two points with integer coefficients, because those are probably the ones that are intended for you to use, but I don't see another one. So the next best thing is maybe the other intercept, which really looks like it happens at x equals 1 half. So we're going to go with that. Plugging those into, our expression gives us that negative 4 would be a times b to the 0 plus k. b to the 0 is 1, giving us negative 4 equals a plus k. Also, the other point, the other intercept, gives us 0 is equal to a times b to the 1 half plus k or the square root of b is equal to negative k over a. Now having solved for b, I can square both sides. Squaring both sides possibly loses some information about positive or negative numbers, but remember in exponential functions, the base is presumed to be positive. So b is going to be equal to k squared over a squared. Observe that this function has a horizontal asymptote at y equals negative five. That seems pretty clear from the way it's drawn. Generally, an exponential function has a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. The way you get a different horizontal asymptote is with a vertical translation. So this must be slid down by five. K is negative five. Taking k equals negative five into our expression negative four equals a plus k allows us to solve for a is equal to one. That's nice. Then b is equal to k squared over a squared. We know the values of k and a, so b is equal to 25. Therefore, our function can be given by 25 to the x minus five. Problem 15, let's describe the long run behavior of f of n equals negative 4 times 1 fifth to the n minus 4. What happens as n goes to minus infinity to our function f of n? So we're raising 1 fifth to negative powers, which is equivalent to raising 5 to positive powers. So 1 fifth to the n will go to plus infinity as n goes to minus infinity. That's being multiplied by negative 4, so the term negative 4 times 1 fifth to the n will be going to negative infinity. We then subtract 4, but that's inconsequential compared to this infinite value. So as n goes to minus infinity, f of n goes to minus infinity as well. What about as n goes to positive infinity? Now we're raising 1 fifth to positive powers, which collapses down to 0. In essence, you're dividing 1 by a very large power of 5. Then we multiply by negative 4, but we were already going to 0, so negative 4 times 0 is still 0. Now the subtraction of 4, the vertical translation, actually matters. Instead of going to 0, since we're subtracting 4, we go to minus 4. So as n goes to infinity, f of n goes to negative 4. And for our last problem, describe the long-run behavior of f of t equals negative 2 times 2 to the t minus 4. What happens as t goes to minus infinity? So now we have 2 to a negative large power. That's like 1 over 2 to a positive large power. That collapses down to 0. Multiplication by negative 2 doesn't change a 0, but subtracting 4 does. So as t goes to minus infinity, f of t goes to minus 4. What about as t goes to plus infinity? So now I have 2 to larger and larger powers. That goes to plus infinity. But it's being multiplied by negative 2, so overall that's going to go to minus infinity. And subtracting 4 does not change going to an infinite value. So as t goes to infinity, f of t goes to minus infinity.